Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, and I hope you guys are having an awesome Sunday. I'm Pastor Kyrus, and I'm so excited to be here with you this morning. I just want to thank Pastor A for just allowing me into his pulpit and on his platform to just come and preach the gospel. Lord, we just thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for all that you're going to do, just all of you and none of me, God. I thank you that you bless everyone that's under the sound of my voice, oh God, that this word does only what you could set out for it to do, God, that it cuts going in and cuts coming out, oh God. I just thank you that I can uh, just be hide me behind the cross, oh God, that I could be a, a clean and pure vessel to be used for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. So the, the title of my sermon this morning is going to be called The Good Shepherd. And when I'm thinking about The Good Shepherd, I'm thinking about David because everybody knows that Psalms 23 is one of the scriptures that everybody quotes and everybody says, and you get it on a t-shirt, you got it on a poster, you got it on your screensaver, you might have it somewhere in your bathroom. Everybody has a Psalms 23 somewhere in their life. But when you think about it written by David, David was once a shepherd and he's speaking from the place of a sheep. And I love that because there was just such a season in my life, and I think in all of our lives, where we're not sure if we're the shepherd or if we're the sheep, but we've got to be in the middle sometimes, and we have to still be able to lead while allowing God to just really direct us so that we can follow. And when you think about David and all of his his fighting, all of his trials, his tribulations, him ruling, him running, him coming back, him winning, his son being crazy, all of the things that he's had to endure and that he had to go through, we we know that he knows God like nobody knows God. If I'm going to go to heaven and talk to anybody, I'm going to ask David why, because I feel like he had such, um, such a revelation and an understanding of what a true shepherd was when I look at Psalms 23, 1 through 6. And so when it it reads, like everyone should know, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, okay? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, okay? So when I I break it down and when you just start to look and see how many times the sheep, you know, the word sheep is mentioned in the Bible. It's over 500 times. You look for shepherd, it's over 200 times. And then if you look in the Hebrew, it's translated and it doesn't just mean shepherd, but it means feeding. And so when we think about David, he's letting us know in verse one, okay? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So there's there's a lot of these scriptures that have two parts, and we're going to break it down, and I want to talk about it because when I look up what a shepherd is, and when I really decided to do some research, and not just go by the scriptures, but actually um, research some things about what a true shepherd was doing to prepare for the sheep, what real shepherds still till this day do to prepare for the sheep, it really allowed me to just have a fresh revelation of that scripture that we quote and we don't take seriously, that we quote, but we don't really put any weight on it, that we quote and we're like, okay, well, let's just teach it to our children because everybody should know it. Even the the saints and the ain'ts normally know Psalms 23, but to be a saint, you've got to live by what Psalms 23 says. In order to be a true saint and to survive being a Christian, you've got to know that Psalms 23 is talking to you. It's not just talking to your brother and your sister, but it's got to be by the rule of life that you live by. And when David is talking in Psalms 23, he's not just saying, oh, all of these good things. No, he starts off and he tells us, I shall not want. Why would he not want? And it's a boastful scripture. The first one says, we, basically you can boast because the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He's saying the Lord is my shepherd. It's almost like he's looking at the world and he's saying, I don't know who's leading you and I'm not really sure who you're following. I don't know whose rod and staff is protecting you, but I know that the Lord is mine. And so when you start to go and he says, I shall not want, he's telling us in the the scriptures following that he shall not want, and this is why. And he gives us instructions on how a good shepherd takes care of him so that he can afford to say, I shall not want. He's not just hoping in something. He's not just believing for it to come, but he's lived it. He's had to do it, and then he's seen it be done for him. 
And I'm telling you today, you're about to see it be done for you. But you got to look for that word. He's saying, I shall not want, I lack nothing because I have the Lord as my shepherd. And if you know the Lord or if you don't know the Lord, but you're just here by happenstance and circumstance, you're going to get to know him today. So when you look at Philippians 4.19, it says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of glory. We're talking about that God, the one that they're talking about in Philippians, the one that David knows so, so well, because he's had to be the man in the cave in between a rock and a hard place. He's been in the palace. He didn't have to go to the pit because, you know, he was already in a cave. So they didn't have to throw him anywhere. He put himself somewhere. And so he's been in these tough situations when he only had God, when he only had a friend, when Goliath was ranting and raving and he's a little shepherd boy that nobody's thinking about. He had his staff and his rod that had the stories of what him and God had been through. Not him and his dad, not him and his brothers, but him and God. So when you look at the history of David and where he's come from and where he's had to go for him to be here. It's because he really has this testimony. Now, we look at the second verse. It says, he maketh me lie down in green pastures. Okay. And he leadeth me beside still waters. When you look at a true shepherd, we know that they're not pushing their sheep over. They're not knocking them down and they're not making them lay down. But if you know anything about sheep, if they are afraid or if they're worried, they do not have rest. They cannot lie down. So what a shepherd does is he goes and he prepares a place to make sure it's a safe place so that they can lie down. When you look at the parallels to our lives today, God is doing his best to make sure it's a safe place, but we don't always want to abide and be where he is, right? But it's not from lack of him shepherding. It's not from lack of him showing up, but it's a lack of vision from us. And I'm praying today that your eyes may be open and that your ears could hear the good news and the gospel of what God is doing. Sheep don't necessarily just lay down. They lay down if they're stressed. They don't lay down if they're stressed. If there's danger lurking, if something is around, they're not going to lay down. Just like it's hard for us to rest when we're stressed. It's hard for us to just take a break and lean on the, the sweet bosom of Jesus. We already, we're always looking for Jesus. Where are you at? But he's already been there. He's, he said he gave us his peace. In Psalms 4 and 8, it says, I, In peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. And then we can go to Matthew 11, 28 and 30. And it says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then if you look at John 14, 27, because it's all up and down in the Bible that he wants to give us rest. It says, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He's, God is trying to tell us day in and day out that, hey, you have it. You've got to just take hold of it. You've got it, but you just got to arrest it. You've got it, but you just got to learn to lean in it and learn to enjoy it and learn to just lean. Even when things look crazy, you got to lean. Even when things look strange, you got to lean and be, begin to just trust in God. When he says he leadeth me beside still waters, sheep will literally drink anything. Okay, I did a whole lot of research. They will literally drink anything and it doesn't and it doesn't matter. They don't have the wherewithal. Sheep are the the toughest to take care of on a farm, but they're also not the smartest. And it sounds a lot like us and I'm included. Because when it comes to God's plan, I don't know. I will do anything. I will just say, "Okay, well I think this is looking good or okay, well I'm thirsty, so this looks like it should work and it looks like it should be okay." But it, but God is always constantly leading and making a way. So when the journey seems uncertain, we have to know we're being led to clean water. When you think about um, where clean water is, we're not looking, all of the pictures that y'all have on your screensavers and it's Psalms 23 and it's a, a green pasture and mountains and nice beautiful streams. This is not how Jesus is leading these sheep. This is not how David had to lead these sheep. He's leading them into a cave. When we think about our walk with Christ, sometimes we looking like we're in a cave. There's some moments where you're not beside a beautiful beach and, oh, we're out at the lake and we're just going to go scuba diving and it's just wonderful. No, when, you, when you're reading in this scripture and the context and the time frame of this scripture, the clean water is in a cave. The clean water is in a dangerous place. And when the, the sheep couldn't get there, the shepherd builds a ramp. 
He takes his time and he builds a ramp. He builds a ramp to guide them through the dangerous places. When you think about um, what we're looking for and we're thinking that things are sometimes easy or that things are really, really tough, you got to remember that God is still providing and he's leading us. He leadeth me beside still waters. He has to take us there. The shepherd has to take the sheep. He's got to prepare a way for the sheep to get there. It's not just out in abundance and overflow in this time that they're speaking of. No, they're, they're going in the caves. They're going in the caverns. They're going in the ditches and in some strange places where you don't think the water should be. But everybody knows that the green only grows in the valley. If you look at mountaintops, there's snow caps, and you don't see a lot of green on the hillside. But if you ever look at a real valley, you see that there is shrubbery there. You see that there is forage there. So when you're in a valley, remember that that is the time to be nourished the most. So we have to think that the journey may sometimes seem uncertain, but that's where we're led to the best things in the uncertainty. Mark 6 and 34 says, when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. How many times is God leading us and teaching us and guiding us and we're fussing and complaining about where we're being led and kind of about how we're being taught and how the lesson feels. And it's, it's not feeling so great, but God, you're saying some good stuff. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for what's happening in my prayer closet. But if I could just see it in real life, but we, he's, he's showing it to us constantly, and he just needs our faith to line up. He just needs us to pair up with him and just hold on because change is coming. Jeremiah 2.13 says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. We, will, we drink from cistern and cisterns and wells that are contaminated and eventually will make us sick. This is when we're thinking about, okay, well, I'll go here and I'll handle it my way. Well, this only, this looks like it should work, and God, you're just going to bless this mess, and oh, I, it's fine, and I can just believe in you because I already got the Holy Spirit, so I don't need a true, true leading because I know I was baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, so I don't have to use discernment. You're just going to fix it and make it right. That's not how that works. God is constantly asking us, just follow me. Just trust me. Just give me a chance. Just, just allow me to be the good shepherd that the Bible talks about so many times that your grandmother knows. If you don't know it, ask your grandma. Ask your grandfather. Ask, ask your auntie. Talk to some people that are in the chemo centers that, that have rang the bell and are cancer free. Talk to some people that have come out of the hospital and have had some surgeries and maybe the scars are proven, but they're walking in the land of the living and seeing how great God has been. Talk to those people if you don't know. We look at verse 3, and it says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, when you think about him restoring our soul, we think, okay, he's refreshed us, and it's wonderful, and all is well. Well, when you think about what a shepherd does to restore their sheep, it means that they're basically turning them from their back right side up. When you look at sheep, if they begin to be weighted down, if their fur is dirty, if uh, if their wool is just too heavy and the shepherd hasn't taken taking the shears to them in a while, they will begin to lean and they'll begin to, to fall and, and it's not an, a comfortable thing. And they'll, they'll make a little bit of noise. They'll say a little bit of something. But the minute they start to be there too long, death is on the way. The minute they start to be there too long, the vultures start circling. The minute they start to be there too long, this is when the, the foxes and the wolves and the hyenas are looking for them. Why? Because we are the sheep. But now we're, we're leaned over because our souls are heavy because I've, I've weighed I'm way too much down there's there's too much on me there's too much on my back and I haven't seen the shepherd in his shears in a while I haven't let him do a little bit of cutting on me in a while but it's time for us to get in his presence it's time for us to for to allow him to to separate the the, the muck that's been on us when a sheep is turned over they're actually it's called being cast when a sheep is cast they're turned over on their back and they're struggling and a good shepherd is it's constantly counting. It's constantly counting. It's constantly counting. Psalms 42 and 11 says, why my souls are you downcast? And remember, a cast sheep is easily killed by predators and prey. And a sign of the sheep is it's getting ready to die. So Psalms 42 and 11 says, why my soul are you cast downcast? So this is, let me just, let's just flip this script. Why my soul are you turned over? Okay. 
Why so disturbed within me? Why are you so heavy? Put your hope in God, for yet I will praise him, my Savior, my God. We are cared for by the good shepherd who's constantly got his eye on us. Matthew, 8 and, uh, Matthew 18 and 12 says, What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 mm, on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? Now, I like this translation because he, it says he will leave the 99 on the hills. He will leave the 99 that are on their way up. He will leave the 99 that are doing well. He will leave the 99 that look like they're okay. And there's some Christians who are like, well, why would he leave me? I'm in the 99 to go find the one. No, this is when you can't be selfish. This is when you got to look at your sister or brother who have turned over, who are downcast, who, are, who have gone astray and said, God, please go, go search for them. This is the time where you You've got to evangelize and say, hey, but I'll reach out for them. I know that I'm on my way up. I know that I'm right side up. I know that things are going well for me, but let's find the one. This is what the good shepherd does. And in this translation, when you look at on the hill, when I'm telling you that the green grows in the valley, when I'm telling you he normally leads them in a valley, when I'm telling you he's normally leading them through dark and sharp corners and edges, he leaves the ones that are doing well, but he'll come search for you if you're weary. He'll come search for you if you're feeling down. He will come and, and not leave you by yourself. Overweight sheep. Overweight sheep. How many of us are overweight? How many of us in our spirit have just been overweight? You look good in your clothes and yeah, you're on the Stairmaster, you're eating right, you on Jenny Craig and whatever else they got out there. But what does your soul weigh? And I don't mean in the kingdom of glory. I mean, what does your soul weigh? Because what have you taken on? What is your soul looking like? Because uh, what is weighing you down with this, the pressures of this world? We are just sitting there sometimes that we're not sitting in his presence so that he can clean us up. We're not sitting in his presence so that we can go through that sharing process. And when you, if you ever look at um, a, a sheep being cut on and their wool coming off, it's not, it's not a pleasant process for the shepherd and it's not a pleasant process for the sheep. And I understand that being a, a sheep myself and sometimes if I'm blessed to shepherd people, then I understand that I've got to give a lot and sometimes I'm giving a hard word, but then there's sometimes that I'm taking one. Why? Because God is sending people in your life or your pastor or your loved ones or your spiritual mother and father to cut on you. Or when you sit in the presence of God and the Holy Spirit begins to say, hey, that wasn't right. You need to apologize. Hey, that wasn't right. You can't act that way. Hey, that wasn't right. I told you that you're the head and not the tail, so stand up. If you, you've got to get in the presence of the good shepherd so he can begin to kind of clean you up a little bit because I'm not talking about a natural weight, but it will manifest in the natural. I'm talking about a spiritual weight. I'm talking about how uh, you can be overweight in the spiritual realm and things start to show up in the natural realm and now you're depressed and now anxiety has set in and now we're at the hospital praying for you but you were just in good health a couple weeks ago but disappointment has shown up and heartbreak is looking like it's your favor but I've come to tell you today that the good shepherd is here and he's coming to change some things around for you he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake John 10.10 10 says the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, though. I have come. Jesus has come. The Holy Ghost has come that they may have life and have it to the full. When you think about a shepherd and you, they're, they're looking at, because they normally hang out in groups. Like one shepherd knows one shepherd. Like I'm an athlete, so I know other athletes. I don't know a whole lot of other people. If you don't play sports and you didn't play sports, I didn't really know who you were because I hung out with my people. So they're hanging out together. But what they did was they cared to perform to make sure they were looking like the good shepherd. So when it says he leads me to path of right, or the path of righteousness for his name's sake, he's not going to be embarrassed. And by him not being embarrassed, you've got to to be successful by him not being embarrassed you've got to be well fed and taken care of because God is going to do it for you but first because of his namesake he's a jealous God he wants to be first he wants the enemy to know I'm still blessing that child I don't care what kind of past you think they have but I'm going to use it for their good 
Now, verse number four is my favorite, okay? It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. And I had the most fun looking this up because everybody thinks, okay, well, he's talking about being scared or maybe I shouldn't be fearful because, you know, uh, death is lurking around the corners and it's dark in the shadows and I'm not sure what we're doing, God. But when we talk about the valley, we talk about the, the, he's, the the shepherds talk about the predators that are waiting, the predators that are lurking, the dangerous pitfalls, and the moments that we're walking through are difficult. But remember, I told you, green only grows in the valley, and the streams of water are plentiful there. So while all of that stuff is lurking around the sheep, the shepherd is there and he's protecting them. The sheep can afford to keep following. Why? Even in the dark shadows, even when I'm not sure of what's happening, even if I'm not sure of what's coming next, I know who I'm following. It says, yea, though I walk through, not to, not to sit there, not to abide in, not to live there and make a home, but I'm walking through. And so a lot of us would get to some places a lot quicker if we remember what it was to walk through. What's that rap song? I'm coming into the bands when I walk through. Play that and get, and get excited about walking through. Get excited about walking it out because you're not staying there. It doesn't say that they stayed there and they took naps. It says, yeah, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. The second part I love talks about, for thou art with me. Okay, so we know that God is taking us to the choicest meadows in the valley. He's taking us to the best streams, and we're receiving God's best in the valley. On the mountaintop, you don't necessarily think that you need God. You might not hear him a lot because you're constantly trying to climb. But sometimes at our lowest moments, when we're the weakest, that's where he can be the strongest. Where we're feeling like, God, I just can't go one more step in. It's looking real dim and I don't know my own way. He's saying, just follow me. He's, he's saying, give me some time with you here because they're tight corners that they're turning. So there's a closeness that the sheep and the shepherd are really having in those moments. There's a closeness and a nurturing that's taking place in those valley moments. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. When you think about the rod, the rod is really a, uh, a right hand extension for the shepherd. Okay, we know that the rod is a weapon and it's usually used for protection to, to ward off any type of animals or any type of uh, predators that will come against them. But the Lord also uses it for guidance in this. When David is talking about the rod, he's still guiding the sheep firmly. He's still guiding them and letting them know, hey, I'm in control and I'm in charge. He's still giving them a bit of a strong finger to the chest, if you will. He's still letting them know, hey, I'm here, but don't play with me. Yeah. When you think about, let's think about the rod of Moses, okay? Because he was the desert shepherd and all the miracles did with it. The rod represents power and authority and the spoken word of God. The, uh, the, the mind... The, the mind of God that deals with the rod is implying authority and divinity in that moment. How many times do we need God to show up with his rod? Now, we're not really asking for it, but we don't know what else to do. And so when he shows up, he straightens us out and the situation. And I'm thinking, Lord, get them, not me. But in him, in him straightening me out, I can see everything else clearly. And so when we think about the rod and leading and guiding us under his hand, it was a tool for discipline, and they would throw it out at the sheep. Like if the, the sheep were going towards bushes or going towards a cliff that could be dangerous or harmful for them, the shepherd would throw it out. And, and put it and make sure that it landed in front of them and they knew not to cross it. This is a time where you need to be looking for God that he's thrown out his rod and saying, hey, don't go there. He's saying, hey, that's not safe over there. Hey, this is a place you shouldn't go. Oh, don't eat that and don't eat at these people's house because they got some stuff going on. Or, oh, don't, don't show up for this event even though I know you want to be there and I know you want to be seen. This is a time where you might just need to be heard or, or be seen silent somewhere else but maybe not where God is trying to keep you from. If you look at Ezekiel 
20, 37, it says, I will take note of you as you pass under my rod, and I will bring you into the bond of covenant. There is a, there is a, a process where the, the sheep go under the shepherd's rod, and it's a gate that is opening basically for them because the rod, uh, con- the rod concept, you know, it conveys authority, the discipline, and the defense of the sheep. So God is saying in Ezekiel, if you pass under my rod, there's a covenant between us. If I'm letting you come over here, there's a covenant between us. When you think of the staff, it's a slender stick, and sometimes a shepherd would just put the staff, he'll lift up little lambs, and he'll move them from their mother so that it doesn't get his sin on it, and the mother will reject him. But it's a slender stick, and sometimes he would just lay it on their side. Sometimes he would just lay it on their chest to let them know, hey, I'm here with you. You might not, you might not feel me too close, but I'm letting you know that the extension of me is still here. That though we didn't see the face of Jesus, we've got the Holy Ghost. He's letting you know in those still quiet moments when he's sending ministering angels and people just to, to give you a hug and tell you it's okay or that random check in the mail. He's letting you know, hey, I'm touching you and I'm still here. When the anointing begins to fall and you're thinking you've been out of the presence for so long, God is letting you know I still see you. Verse 5, it says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Everybody knows. Everybody's like, okay, Lord, you can't cancel my enemies because they need to see me be here and eat. You can't cancel my enemies because you're preparing the table, and they need to watch me have this buffet. That is not what this means. It's in the good shepherd. He literally plants good seed. When he's saying he's preparing for them, he's preparing the way for them. He's preparing a harvest for them. He's preparing um, a land for them. He goes and he searches it out to make sure that there's no shrubbery or poisonous bushes. He goes in other people's lands or along the way and he plucks things up. So when you're walking and you're missing people, when you're walking and you think, well, where did so-and-so go? They just fell off. When you're walking and you think, well, how did I get let go from that job? But then the building gets shut down. When you're walking and you think, how did, how did I just fall off and people just become missing? Or why didn't this work out? Because he went ahead of you and he plucked some things. Luke 22 and 31, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that you uh, may be sifted as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, mm, whoo, glory, that, they, that thy faith would not fail. And when thou art coveted, strengthened by their brethren. The devil has come to sift you, Simon, but I have gone ahead of you and prepared a way like the good shepherd that he is, that you would not fail, that you would not be sifted as wheat, that you would not, when they begin to do the shifting of the the wheat, that you wouldn't be tossed away to and fro. He's saying, hey, I've prepared a place for you so that you can just uh, abide in me and know that I'm there, that I went before you. When it says thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runneth over, this was one of my favorite parts to to um to research because the shepherd talks about flies in the ointment when you think about a shepherd and their sheep there you don't think okay well they really anoint them they do they use olive oil and they use different fragrances and different scents because there's nose flies and there's little bugs that will burrow in their head and then get under their skin and they'll kill themselves because why their mind is now uh, going crazy because there's something under them but they can't feel it they can't get it out there they're not strong enough to scratch it and comb it themselves so what they'll do is they'll begin to sometimes kill themselves or kill one another or run off a cliff because their minds are just gone. How many times are our minds just gone because we haven't allowed the Lord to just anoint us or given us fresh oil? We're still working on the oil and the old wine from yesterday. We haven't got up and said, God, anoint me fresh and new for this season. We're still working on the old season and what God has done. So when you think about that protective layer and God just pouring out, uh, you read in Psalms 147, 3 through 4, and it says, He heals the brokenhearted and He binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them by name. The shepherd talks about scab time. He talks about how uh, there's a parasite that sits on the sheep's head. And when they're loving each other affectionately, they're spreading it. So when I thought about in the spiritual realm, how many times are we loving somebody affectionately that we shouldn't be touching? How many times are we congregating with people that shouldn't even really be in our presence? How many times are we, are we with somebody and it's spreading infection, it's spreading fear, and it's spreading like wildfire because then they... they 
have the whole, the whole flock is infected. Why? Because they're all rubbing together. They're all in good company, but bad company at the same time. When you look at Philippians 4, 8, it says, finally, brethren, whatever, whatever so things are true, whatever so things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. When I think about his cup running over, when I think about him anointing, uh, anointing our head with oil, he's telling us to keep your mind stayed on me. When I think about Ooh, when I think about Calvary and what he poured out so that I could have, when I think about my cup running over, he had to pour out into me for my cup to run over. And if you ever look at a, um, a picture of a shepherd anointing and pouring that oil on his sheep, it ran down like the oil on David's beard. Why? Because there's a covering that God wants to put on you, but you got to come through the gate so that he can do it. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. This is simple. We're going to keep it simple. We're going to make it real plain. If I'm following goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy is following me. If I'm in the presence of goodness and mercy and following God and where he's called me to be and doing what he's told me to do, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's simple. It, this is a real simple one. It's the last one, and it's, he's making it plain. If you are a, a sheep and I'm the good shepherd, David is saying, hey, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't have to want for goodness and mercy. Why? Because I'm following the good shepherd. He's leading me there. He's guiding me there. He's covering me in the dark places. He's, he's prepared a way for me in the valley. He's made things plain. He's walking with his weapons. He's walking in things know that I have a covering that's present, that the wolves aren't afraid of just me. But when the Holy Ghost shows up everybody's running when the lion from the tribe of judah shows up everybody's got to go so when you think about this it's simple let's keep it simple live it simple understand it that god's goodness and mercy follows you because you will be following him he is goodness and mercy. He is love and kindness. And when you think about the second half, and it says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. This is also really plain, guys. He's not, he's not telling you it's just one place, but it's, it's abiding and dwelling in his presence. When they're saying dwelling here, it's simplified, basically meaning I'm happy here and I will not be leaving. I am loving it here and we are having a good time. Why? Because I've made this my dwelling place because I'm under God's care. I, I don't have to worry. I don't have to fear. I'm in God's presence. When he says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord, I'll dwell in the presence of God. I'm I'm going to dwell in the heart of God. I'm going to dwell in whatever land. The shepherd could go wherever, and the sheep, because he's good to them, are going to follow. That's a word for somebody in this season. Follow. I don't care what it looks like. Yes, it's unfamiliar, and yes, this is a strange territory. No, you don't know these people, and they don't know you, but they will, because you've got a good shepherd who's led you there. So don't be afraid to uproot. Don't be afraid to, to grow something new in this season. Don't be afraid of the new things that God could be doing. And if you, if you don't know him, and I'm talking to you about not being afraid and doing something new, why don't you try Jesus on your journey? Why don't you allow God to come in? Because you've done everything else. You've had, you followed on social media. Uh, click follow, click like, click share. Why don't you click, Lord, let me just come into my heart and I make you my Lord and Savior. You've done everything else and you followed and tried to settle places. But this is not the season of settling. This is a season of thriving, not just surviving. We've got a good shepherd who wants to lead us. And if you don't know him today, if you don't know the, the good shepherd that I'm speaking about, the one who was crucified on Calvary, ask the Lord to just come into your heart and, and just ask him to say, I make you my Lord and Savior. I believe that you bled and died on the cross for me. Come into my life and do something with it. He will come right in and give you a revelation and an understanding of who he is and who you are to him. Because you can't be a shepherd with no sheep. But if you've got sheep and you've got someone who wants to follow, they're going to take care of them. 
This is a season where we've got to get under a covering. We've got to, to ask the Lord to give us a fresh wind, a fresh oil. The old thing won't do. The old thing will not do. The old thing will not do. It is 2022, and the old thing will no longer do. God is faithful, guys, and I'm just going to go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your people, God. I, I thank you for the lives that were changed and the souls that were saved today, God. Just come in and do what only you can do, God. We just thank you for blessing their coming and their going. I thank you for a God kind of encounter for them in this season, that they would know you as a good shepherd and that they would take instruction and heed your word to be a successful sheep, God. We just thank you, we love you, and we honor you. Stay tuned to see what's next. And remember to trust God for favor in life.